welcome to Do the Right Thing, your weekly writing prompt podcast. I'm Matthias. And I'm Jarvis. But Jarvis and I are getting lost in a chaotic scene of wild animals being walked in the streets and scribes spilling ink on each other. And the king is dressed as a camel. And it's really confusing. Exactly. And to make sense of this very confusing scene, we are issuing a challenge. Your goal is to sit down each week and write a complete short story using three or four randomly generated words. Uh, Then uh, come listen to us on the podcast as we read a story, talk about what we learned in reading it, and then talk about stories sent in by you wonderful, wonderful writers. Exactly. We're simply here to help you do the right thing. A doof media Media production. Um, so, so, uh, what are, what are this week's words? Let's just, let's just, let's just go straight into it. Let's, let's vamp. Yeah, let's just hop into it. So, this week's words are flatware, spin, thumb, and tie. Wonderful. Um, the, the story we're reading this week, uh, is called, uh, Four, Four Beasts in One by Edgar Allan Poe, uh, widely known to be Poe's worst story. Um, it is. So, <laughs> so, so, so we, we, we read the story. Um, and, and I, I, I think actually Jarvis, can you tell me why, why you decided this story, uh, for this week when you were, when you were looking for them originally? Well, yeah. So, uh, I was looking through, through stories and this story really caught my eye solely because of, I enjoy the voice that is, that's being used here. And overall, just the spectacle of what Poe is describing here. And then as I kept reading, I realized, oh my God. What is happening? Where are we going? What is Poe trying to to do? So I found it just really funny to, that a, a very famed writer like Poe has produced such a crock of shit. I am exaggerating. I mean, somewhat. like it is showing off, but within this story, it feels also misplaced and exaggerated to the point to where I'm not even really sure where we're going or what we are doing or even why he decided to write this in the first place because it doesn't really have an ending yeah it's it is very strange um we shouldn't talk about it too much before we get into it so but but we we selected uh the story this week and and then as after we we came back in preparation for this episode preparing for what to to say about it we realized that this is not like actually like a really great story to emulate and in fact probably should be more of a guide of like don't don't do this uh, what and, not and I, to do i think i it, we, we also think it, it works as a pretty good story of just like hey um you know famous and very extremely talented author edgar Allan poe um he is he's a very good writer and, and a wonderful poet yes. as well but but also a great writer like not just not just uh, uh poetry but prose as well and he also wrote shit so mm-hmm. like you should feel good about your stuff too like exactly I, I mean I certainly am going to feel better about my stuff after mm-hmm. after seeing delirious of uh, <laughs> I don't know I, I was trying to make a make a clever thing it but it is it, delirious and very harebrained but I do kind of see this as Poe's submission to do, do the, the right, right thing. thing exactly yeah. yeah I think that absolutely suits it so <laughs> one thing and, and I'll mention at the end of the episode is that uh, we'll be starting the doof the right thing contest actually back up and, and also the um the doof uh, fan art contest uh which we let slip by um a, a bit ago um very very chaotic chaotic times we, which we all lament because uh normally we do it around Halloween as well and we inv- uh we have a like a a costume challenge, a, a, a like fandom costume challenge, and that's really fun. But we missed it this time, um, and it's uh, it's very unfortunate. We're very sad about that. We 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 have vowed to not let that happen again. So the do the right thing, a do for the right thing contest starts the day that this episode comes out. There will be a post um, on the website talking about it and in the description for this episode. And I'll probably edit it into the um, the the challenge for this week as well. So plenty of places to to look at the details. Uh, but basically um write a uh, e- either either uh, write a new story uh for for do the right thing it, it can be any do the right thing story that you've written in the last six months including any of the ones leading up to the due date but uh, give it a polish uh keep it under two thousand words just to to keep it readable uh for many people um and of course you know if if your your best version of it ends up being over three thousand words you know keep, keep that for yourself but you know cut it down for for us to read it um but yeah, I'm very excited to, to start up the Do for the Right Thing contest. And remember, there's cash prizes. 
Nice. And uh, there's there's uh, a lot of wonderful stuff here. And if you aren't considering writing it for it, uh, which you absolutely should, but uh, you can also just read those stories that other people are are writing whenever mm-hmm. the, the contest ends. So, uh, but let's let's uh, just let's just read the story for this week, and and I'll yep. mention this again at the end of the episode. <laughs> let's go on and get into it. This story is called Four Beasts in One by Edgar Allan Poe. It has a subtitle of The Homo Camel Leopard. Antiochus Epiphanes is very generally looked upon as the Gog of the prophet Ezekiel. This honor, however, is more properly attributable to Cambyses, the son of Cyrus. And indeed, the character of the Syrian monarch does by no means stand in need of any adventitious embellishment. His accession to the throne, or rather his usurpation of the sovereignty, 171 years before the coming of Christ, his attempt to plunder the temple of Diana Ephesus, his implacable hostility to the Jews, his pollution of the Holy of Holies, and his miserable death at Taba after a tumultuous reign of 11 years, are circumstances of a prominent kind, and therefore more generally noticed by the historians of his time, impious, dastardly, cruel, silly, and whimsical achievements when, which make up the sum total of his private life and reputation. Let us suppose, gentle reader, that it's now the year of the world 3850, and let us, for a few minutes, imagine ourselves at that most grotesque habitation of man, the remarkable city of Antioch. To be sure, there were, in Syria and other countries, sixteen cities of that appellation, besides the one of which I more particularly allude, but ours was the one that went by the name of Antiochia Epidaphne, from its vicinity to the little village of Daphne, where stood a temple to that divinity. It was built, although about this matter there is some dispute, by Seleucius Nicanor, the first king of that country after Alexander the Great, in memory of his father Antiochus and became immediately the residence of the Syrian monarchy. In the flourishing times of the Roman Empire, it was the ordinary station of the prefect of the eastern provinces, and many of the emperors of the queen city, among whom may be mentioned especially Varus and Valens, spent here the greater part of their time. But I perceive we have arrived at the city itself. Let us ascend this battlement, and throw our eyes upon the town and neighboring country." What broad and rapid river is that which forces its way with innumerable falls through the mountainous wilderness and finally through the wilderness of buildings, you say? That is the Orontes, and it is the only water in sight with the exception of the Mediterranean, which stretches like a broad mirror about twelve miles off to the southward. Every one has seen the Mediterranean, but let me tell you, there are few who have had a peep at Antioch. By few, I mean few who, like you and me, have had, at the same time, the advantages of a modern education. Therefore cease to regard that sea, and give your whole attention to the mass of houses that lie beneath us. You will remember that it is now the year of the world 3850. Were it later, for example, were it the year of our Lord 1845, we would be deprived of this extraordinary spectacle. In the 19th century, Antioch is, that is to say, Antioch will be, in a lamentable state of decay. It will have been, by that time, totally destroyed at three different periods by three successive earthquakes. Indeed, to say the truth, what little of its former self may then remain will be found in so desolate and ruinous a state that the patriarch will have removed residence to Damascus. This is well. I see you profit by my advice, and are making the most of your time in inspecting the premises, in satisfying your eyes, with the memorials and the things of fame that most renown the city. I beg pardon, I had forgotten that Shakespeare will not flourish for 1750 years to come, but does not the appearance of Epidaphne justify me in calling it grotesque? It is well fortified, and in this respect is as much indebted to nature as to art. You say, very true. You say, there are a prodigious number of stately palaces. There are. And the numerous temples, sumptuous and magnificent, may bear comparison with the most lauded of antiquity, you say. All this I must acknowledge. Still, there is an infinity of mud huts and abominable hovels. We cannot help perceiving abundance of filth in every kennel, and were it not for the overpowering fumes of idolatrous incense, I have no doubt we would find a most intolerable stench. Did you ever behold streets so insufferably narrow, or houses so miraculously tall? What gloom their shadows cast upon the ground! 
It is well the swinging lamps in those endless colonnades are kept burning throughout the day. We should otherwise have the darkness of Egypt in the time of her desolation. You say, It is cert a strange place. What is the meaning of yonder singular building? See, it towers above all the others, and lies to the eastward of what I take to be the royal palace. That is the new temple of the sun, who is adored in Syria under the title of Ella Gabala. Hereafter, a very notorious Roman emperor will institute this worship in Rome, and hence to derive a cognomen, Heliogabalus. I dare say you would like to take a peep at the divinity of the temple. You need not look up at the heavens. His sonship is not there, at least not the sonship adored by the Syrians. That deity will be found in the interior of yonder building. He is worshipped under the figure of a large stone pillar terminating at the summit in a cone or a pyramid, whereby is denoted fire. You say, Hark, behold, who can those ridiculous beings be, half-naked with their faces painted, shouting and gesticulating to the rabble? Some few are mountebanks. Others, more particularly, belong to the race of philosophers. The greatest portion, however, those especially who belabor the populace with clubs, are the principal courtiers of the palace, executing, as in duty pound, some laudable comicality of the king's. You quote, But how, what have we here? Heavens, the town is swarming with wild beasts. How terrible a spectacle! How dangerous a peculiarity! Terrible, if you please, but not in the least de degree dangerous. Each animal, if you take it, if you will take some pains to observe, is following very quietly in the wake of its master. Some few, to be sure, are led with a rope about the neck, but these are chiefly the lesser or timid species. The lion, the tiger, and the leopard are entirely without restraint. They have been trained without difficulty to their present profession, and attend upon their respective owners in the capacity of valet de chambre. It is true, there are occasions when nature asserts her violated dominions, but then the devouring of a man-at-arms, or the throttling of a consecrated bull, is a circumstance of too little moment to be more than hinted at epidaphne. Quotes you, But what extraordinary tumult do I hear? Surely this is a loud noise even for Antioch. It argues some commotion of unusual interest. Well, yes, undoubtedly. The king has ordered some novel spectacle, some gladiatorial exhibition at the Hippodrome, or perhaps the massacre of the Scythian prisoners, or the conflagration of his new palace, or the tearing down of a handsome temple, or, indeed, a bonfire of a few Jews. The uproar increases, shouts of laughter ascend the skies, the air becomes dissonant with and wind instruments, and horrible with clamor of a million throats. Let us descend, for the love of fun, and see what is going on. This way, be careful. Here we are in the principal street, which is called the Street of Timarchus, the sea of peoples coming this way, and we shall find a great difficulty in stemming the tide. They are pouring through the alley of Heraclides, which leads directly from the palace. Therefore, the king is most probably among the rioters. Yes, I hear the shouts of the herald proclaiming his approach in the pompous phraseology of the east. We shall have a glimpse of his person as he passes by the temple of Ashima. Let us ensconce ourselves in the vestibule of the sanctuary. He will be here anon. In the meantime, let us survey this image. What is it? Oh, it is the god Ashima in proper person. You perceive, however, that he is neither a lamb, nor a goat, nor a satyr. Neither has he much resemblance to the pan of the Arcadians. Yet all these appearances have been given, I beg pardon, will be given, by the learned of future ages to the Ashima of the Syrians. Put on your spectacles and tell me what it is. What is it? Quotes you, Bless me, it is an ape! True, a baboon, but by no means the less a deity. His name is a derivation of the Greek Simia. What great fools are antiquarians! But see, see, yonder scampers a ragged little urchin. Where is he going? What is he bawling about? What does he say? Oh, he says the king is coming in triumph, that he is d dressed in state, that he has just finished putting to death with his own hand a thousand chained Israelitish prisoners. For this expl exploit, the ragamuffin is lauding him to the skies. Hark, here comes a troop of a similar description. They have made a Latin hymn upon the valor of the king, and are singing it as they go. When it may be thus paraphrased as, A thousand, a thousand, a thousand. 
a thousand, a thousand, a thousand. We, with one warrior, have slain a thousand, a thousand, a thousand, a thousand. Sing a thousand over again. So ho, let us sing. Long life to our king, who knocked over a thousand so fine. So ho, let us roar. He has given us more red gallons of gore than all Syria can furnish of wine. You say, do you hear that flourish of trumpets? Yes, the king is coming. See, the people are aghast with admiration and lift up their eyes to the heavens in reverence. He comes. He is coming. There he is. Who? Where? The king, you say? Do not behold him. I cannot say that I perceive him. Then you must be blind. You respond, very possible. See, I still see nothing but the tumultuous mob of idiots and madmen who are busy in prostrating themselves before a gigantic camel leopard and endeavoring to obtain a kiss of the animal's hoofs. See, the beast has very justly kicked one of the rabble over, and another, and another, and another... Indeed, I cannot help admiring the animal for the excellent use he is making of his feet. Rabble, indeed. Why, these are the noble and free citizens of Epidaphne. Beasts, you say, take care that you are not overheard. Do you not perceive that the animal has a visage of a man? Why, my dear sir, that camel leopard is no other than Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus the Illustrious, king of Syria and the most potent of all the autocrats of the East. It is true that he is entitled, at times, Antiochus Epimanes, Antiochus the Madman, but that is because all people have not the capacity to appreciate his merits. It is also certain that he is at present ensconced in the hide of beasts, and is doing his part to play the part of a camel leopard. But this is done for the better sustaining his dignity as king. Besides, the monarch is of gigantic stature, and the dress is therefore neither unbecoming nor overlarge. We may, however, presume he would not have adopted it but for some occasion of a special estate. Such, you will allow, is the massacre of a thousand Jews. With how superior a dignity the monarch perambulates on all fours. His tail, you perceive, is held aloft by his two principal con concubines, Eline and Argelais, and his whole appearance would be infinitely preposing pre were it not for the protuberance of his eyes, which will certainly come out of his head, and the queer color of his face, which has become nondescript from the quantity of wine he has swallowed. Let us follow him to the hippodrome, whither he is proceeding, and listen to the song of triumph which he is commencing. Who is king but Epiphanes? Say, do you know? Who is king but Epiphanes? Bravo! Bravo! There is none but Epiphanes. No, there is none. Tear down the temples and put out the sun. Well and strenuously sung. The populace are hailing him Prince of Poets, as well as Glory of the East, the Light of the Universe, and Most Remarkable of Camel Leopards. They have inscored his effusion, and do you hear? He is singing it over again. When he arrives at the Hippodrome, he will be crowned with the poetic wreath and anticipation of his victory at the approaching Olympics. But, good Jupiter, you say, what is the matter in the crowd behind us? Behind us, did you say? Oh, ah, I perceive. My friend, it is well that you spoke in time. Let us get into a place of safety as soon as possible. Here, let us conceal ourselves on the arc of this aqueduct, and I will inform you presently of the origin of the commotion. It has turned out, as I have been anticipating, the singular appearance of the camel leopard, head of a man, has, it seems, given offense to the notions of propriety entertained, in general, by the wild animals domesticated in the city. A mutiny has been the result, and, as is usual upon such occasions, all human efforts will be of no avail in quelling the mob. Several of the Syrians have already been devoured, but the general voice of the four-footed patriots, the animals, seems to be up for eating up the camel leopard. The prince of poets is therefore upon his hinder legs, running for his life. His courtiers have left him, left him in the lurch, and his concubines have followed so excellent an example. Delight of the universe, thou art in a sad predicament. Glory of the east, thou art in danger of mastication. Therefore never regard so piteously that tail. It will undoubtedly be draggled in the mud, and for this there is no help. Look not behind thee, then, at its unavoidable degradation, but take courage, ply thy legs with vigor, and scud for the hippodrome. 
remember that thou art Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus the Illustrious, also Prince of Poets, Glory of the East, the Light of the Universe, and Most Remarkable of Camel Leopards. Heavens, what a power of speed thou art displaying! What a capacity for leg bail thou art developing! Run, Prince! Bravo, Epiphanes! Well done, Camel Leopard! Glorious Antiochus! He runs! He leaps! He flies! Like an arrow from a catapult, he approaches the Hippodrome. He leaps! He shrieks! He is there! This is well, for hadst thou, glory of the East, been half a second longer in reaching the gates of the amphitheater, there is not a bear's cub in Epidaphne that would not have had a nibble at thy carcass. L let us be off. Let us take our departure, for we shall find our delicate modern ears unable to endure the vast uproar which is about to commence in celebration of the king's escape. Listen, it has already commenced. See, the whole town is topsy-turvy. You quote, Surely this is the most populous city of the East. What a wilderness of people! What a jumble of all ranks and ages! What a multiplicity of sects and nations! What a variety of costumes! What a babel of languages! What a screaming of beasts! What a tinkling of instruments! What a parcel of philosophers! Come, let us be off, I say. But you respond, Stay a moment, I see a fast hubbub in the hip Hippodrome. What is the meaning of it, I beseech you? That, I respond, Oh, nothing! The noble and free citizens of Epidaphne, being, as they declare, well satisfied of the faith, valor, wisdom, and divinity of their king, and having, moreover, been eyewitness of his late superhuman agility, do think it no more than their duty to invest his brows, in addition to the poetic crown, with a wreath of victory in the foot-race, a wreath which it is evident he must obtain at the celebration of the next Olympiad, and which, therefore, they will now give him an advance. Wow, wow, wow. That was a fantastic reading. Uh, I do really like how your reading of it did kind of bring life to this very yeah, dense text. <laughs> yeah, I liked it a lot more reading it out loud than I did reading it. Um, for reading it, what, what, what do you call that? Manually? With my eyes? I don't know yeah, what to say. Normally, why I have guess. We, why have we still not made a word for listening to a text like it's like honestly there, it's there so really silly. should be a word a word for it i mean now listening to like a fucking audiobook or something is more more popular to where you are digesting a text completely differently though. yeah it's so strange that we don't maybe we, we can just like portmanteau it we can be like auto reading or something yeah yeah but yeah i mean definitely just the way that you did read that broke it up to the point to where mm -hmm. uh it made a lot more sense in the context of like what of how i was reading it to where this story seems a a lot like someone is recounting the, the history of a place as they're walking you through it to where this person is talking to you about about the old king and and how this this king run, ran so far, and exactly why this this sort of kingdom fell. Yeah, yeah. it's um it's definitely <laughs> a lot more enjoyable of a read um out loud. Um, mm -hmm. but I I'm still gonna hold that I don't I don't quite grasp the the point of this, but that's all right. I mean, okay. yeah. So it seems like it's a basic story of a place and the people that 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 live there. How it's semi-lawless by the same time there is a sort of monarch and how this sort of monarchy did fall and i think the main reason why i did personally choose to really talk about this is because the pros their their cells are very effective i mean this whole piece is written really well it's just that it's building towards something that doesn't fit the overall impact that you're looking for i mean nowhere within this story Am I caring about any of the characters? And uh, am I really caring about anything else besides the actual prose that are being written? So this story does seem to lack purpose. It lacks that sort of impact that that you're looking for within any short story. Yeah, it's definitely a little bit unconventional mm -hmm. um, uh, for for a short story because it's not even like it's not even like one of those old stories where like the there's a there's a clear like moral here like the king kind of being humiliated i mean like there, maybe there's a little bit there about like the king i don't know having a bunch of titles on him and everyone like interpreting everything he does to be like awesome and great even though it's yeah. like utterly ridiculous and leads to a disaster 
Um, but mm-hmm. it doesn't either seem that that's like, it, like, I mean, you could, you could cut half the story and it would, it would still <laughs> like, like, like we don't get to the part about the, the king story. and the animals until, you know, two thirds of the way through. Yeah. So it's, I'm just like, what, what is the point of the, the first, you know, half the section? Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, really for, for me, this story borders a parody but it feels like a satire because the narrator is is talking about all of these things a very lighthearted comical tone to where you kind of want to laugh but you're at a loss because I don't know. It feels very dis disjointed. There's a clear gap between the way this story is being written and exactly what is being written to where I do find it very I find it comical. And I kind of feel that it's bordering this to where it seems more like a parody than anything else. But then again, it's not a parody, which, which, is, the, which is the strange part. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, maybe after we record this, I'll, I'll do like some deeper research. I, I, I did some a little bit of research finding out where this was published and, and, and things, but none of it was like, it really cued me into anything Why? regarding the interpretation. I did read some Goodreads reviews, most of which were just very confused <laughs> as well. All of them were, were confused. Um, yeah, I, I just wonder if like maybe there's an original context that like makes this maybe you know maybe he wrote this as a, like a letter to his friend or maybe he's like mm-hmm. intentionally like making fun of a uh, an antiquarian or something who knows yeah and i mean um, really i would love to, to know like what this was published in was this published along with other works of the like or was this sort of a solo outlier piece by poe that was maybe published on a like one-off in some sort of magazine like i don't know i found a really terrible article written on epub epublib.info okay um i think it's the english second language and it also has a bunch of really shitty advertisements on it so i don't Mm. really trust it um apparently this was also published in uh tales of the grotesque and arabesque a collection of previously published short stories by edgar Allan poe um, which has some some good stories in it, like uh, the fall of the House of Usher, okay, which is a, which is a good one. Um, mm. So so this story was coupled with, I guess, better short stories that have a more co- coherent purpose and plot. Yes. Okay. So I'm guessing this is just a <laughs> like a filler story. Yeah, well, basically. It, like, like it was originally. It, it's the first story of of the second volume. So oh, okay. You know, they say start off with the best and then, or start off with the second best and end with the with the best. Yeah. Um, that does not pose good <laughs> signs for the for that second volume. Yeah. If if this is the second best story in that whole volume, I'm gonna pose a question to you, Matthias. So we so we both you know truly think that this work does have a lot not going for it. But, <laughs> but what was like. Throughout your your reading, what was the part that you almost saw like a flicker of hope for this story? Well, I I think it's fun. I think it's yeah, I, and it's I think the fun. repeated the the word that keeps getting used and that we're we're using it too is uh, the stuff about the spectacle. This is a very like chaotic and active scene, mm-hmm. but it's fairly easy to understand. Even when I was reading it um, non verbally, um, it was not too difficult to understand. Even as we kind of we we cover uh the entire like history of, of uh, a short history of the city and yeah. we cover the entire geography of it we go into different districts but um al- although I, I i will note we don't really get into like a specific like scene scene Never. like we don't yeah. like plant ourselves into the street and like describe what all the colors of the people are mm-hmm. you know it is it is very um sort of distant we do get a pretty good understanding of all the sort of sorts of things that are that are going on here um and uh, it's a very, very active place. And it sort of, it comes together, right? All those animals that we mentioned before, what a wild scene it is. I love how it's the animals that are tame. Yes. That, <laughs> that have the leashes, but the ones that aren't, don't for some reason. Um, <laughs> and they just start like devouring people, but it's like no big deal. Um, so so for a challenge, I wanted to, to challenge y'all readers to, um, it, this is not necessarily like a, hey, write this kind of story, but more challenge yourselves to write as confusing a scene as possible without confusing 
the audience, if that makes yes. sense. It is to write a huge overarching scene that could be chaotic. It could be filled with uh, the most my minute details. The challenge is to go as far left as you possibly can while still maintaining solid plot, solid character, and solid story. Because, I mean, with, with, with this story, for me, it is half floaty and it's half distinct and i feel that a good challenge would be for the audience y'all to really create something in the same vein while making it even more grounded yeah so some some other like a a sort of a sub suggestion and we, we might do this actual challenge eventually is maybe um take a make your story sort of writing a single moment and Mm -hmm. going through the physical physicality of a scene and describing every part of that moment maybe um just just something that's active something perhaps chaotic uh something with a lot to keep track of but challenge yourselves to uh make the audience keep track of all that so I, I mean, my, my natural suggestion, and of course you can do something else, but to describe a party or a festival or something of the sort, so, so, something like that, something very active with a lot of, of people, a lot of actors, um, not like actor actors. I mean, like a lot of active personas, although yeah. who knows? I mean, you could do a theater and you could describe what's on the stage and what's going on in the audience as well. Oh, hey, you know what? That would, um, that would actually work very well. Yeah. A, a yeah. Scene like this. Yeah. Again, like the, the emphasis here is to practice. It's not necessarily to write the most, you know, convincing, you know, story that's that's set in the in a festival. It's so like just focus on the 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 writing a, a complicated thing while not confusing us. Yeah. So just just for some more guidance, um, you know, having sort of a a track to go through. You know, not necessarily describing everything at once but moving on from um like sub setting to sub setting you know one one certain like image like let the mind's eye roam Mm -hmm. across without doing everything at the same time i think uh is probably a good guidance and if you can add in some story there you know some sort of uh, of drama i think that's a really good way to to make people care about what's going on Mm -hmm. um and other things like that um, okay, uh, that's that's what we have for the story this week, and we'll reiterate the challenge at the end of this episode. Uh, but let's get into listener submitted stories. Sure thing. So, so the stories we are going to be reading from this week are by Ace of Sword, Ghost Pac Man Four, Motive Name, Nick Yu, and Sarah Penguin. Thanks for, for, for writing this week. And of course, as usual, we're going to spoil them. So uh, please take the time to pause and go go and read the stories. Uh, like, they're worth reading. And and if you do take the time, maybe comment on one of them. Um, it was actually a very nice ratio of, of comments to the stories. Great. Actually, like, very consistently, like, four comments per story about. Mm-hmm. I mean, not every, not every story got got that many comments but the ratio is something like that so um yeah we really really appreciate that that's that's fantastic to see that back and forth um and in absolutely commendable um every single one of y'all are our heroes so mm, thank you 100 percent. and uh before we roll on into our first story i would like to re remind y'all that the challenge for this week was in nested narrative so uh i think a good portion of these stories uh basically yeah, told, told, told a story with within a story so we're going to be talking about that talking about how they did it successfully and we're gonna have a great time so the first story up for this week is by ace of sword with tangle that's right um so this is a callback to i think ace of sword also um wrote a wrote a sequel to this a bit ago um, but the, this is the third entry in a, in a sort of series. Um, we have um, a sort of important character, the Rector, which is Rector. maybe like a, maybe it's like a, um, a derivative of director, mm-hmm. maybe, um, of this uh, sort of like a, a, a academy, mage academy, mage institution, um, mage. That none of these is the correct word. I'm sorry for missing it. It's a sword. Um, <laughs> she's inside of her office and inside comes a, a servant to, to give her some news. And she takes a moment to just think about how like she looks so, you know, professional and poised and magnificent in front of this. Uh, her, her office is sort of like cut off by this, um, cut in half by this gigantic orb um, that the rest of the Academy sort of built around. Um, this sort of like shimmering... Um, 
orb of particles that that like, sort of makes her you know look larger than life and defined and and really really important looking except she actually doesn't know a thing about the, it at all <laughs> um uh master the the original scholar that invented the um seven spells that that were taught by the academy now only six because one of them is uh is 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 gone um left it as a sort of like puzzle for them they don't know what to do with it and she feels like like the academy the institution as a whole and um in general they're kind of just like barely holding on to power barely holding on to their existence barely holding on to like a, a claim to exist because they are holding on to the the bare amount of knowledge left um as like there's only six spells left and they they, they are risk of being lost as well and so this uh, student has been going out and going out and talking to this conjurer a, a cheap magician and they're afraid that he's going to pass on the knowledge of the of the school without their approval and um she's pretty upset about it and so we get a little bit of, like politicky but for the most part it's uh, just a setup of like what a precarious situation the school is in and, and how like false their power is mm-hmm. yeah definitely and i uh, really do like this setup i mean overall it's written very well um which you know is definitely mirrored in the uh previous two entries uh, and overall, I just think that this entry definitely deepened the sort of world building that was set up in the previous two. I love how much, as you said, how much how much politicking is really being said about this um, school. And it really shows you how important this school seems to be for the wider world. And yeah, I mean, overall, this is definitely setting up for um, a sort of crisis to to happen later on it does feel like this this tension that that has been built throughout the previous two entries is slowly reaching this sort of fever pit so i am definitely looking forward to seeing where these where this school and this uh, main character do do go to next but overall fantastic job yep um i i really really liked it and um i find this sort of like shallow hold on on power really really interesting and, and compelling oh definitely all right. Up next is by Ghost Pac-Man Four with with Heart to Heart, which also is a fantastic early. I think it's a fantastic late '80s um, crime drama show that my grandmother loves. <laughs> okay, shout out to Heart to Heart. <laughs> um, so uh, this is a I, I think uh, the second or, or third entry in. Um... Or just just one um, that uh, Ghost Pac-Man Four has written before. We talked about it before, where. Um, this uh this little urchin this this person on the run from the the medieval fantasy authorities um has obtained a rotten sword uh a sword by some forgotten god um that is sort of like a spirit of like death and decay and pestilence and uh, the wielder automatically kills anything that comes within arm's reach basically mm-hmm. um including just bugs the the wielder just swings out its arm and, and cuts a fly in half <laughs> and the sword is rotting and covered in viscera and gore um now mostly dry but stinking and it's just like horrible um and um our our character starts like it, it just wants to be rid of it but it starts talking to the sword, which which it's magic, so it talks back, and it has its own twisted morality. It sees that murdering is the only it, to get peace and love is uh, is only possible through everything becoming still and everything dying. Uh, the only way to 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 peace is through the end of violence, uh, and that is what did I achieve? The only true form of love is selfless giving of oneself. What is more loving and peaceful than the corpse? Giving freely to the world, causing no bloodshed but its own. To rot is to give sustenance to the lowest of beings. <laughs> um, which is a very interesting perspective, and I, I, I'd like to talk about that for a second. Um, but the uh, the sword talks about... Uh, the, our, our wheeler laments that they just don't know how to let go of the blade. And uh, the sword uh, continues on to, and, and tells the story of another wielder that it used to have that's found it in a field of corpses. Um, that uh, their soul was like a bundle of fish hooks, which mm. I think is, is wonderful. That they basically attached to everyone around them, dug into them, and whenever they pulled away, they took parts of themselves with them. So that basically they, they became less and less and kind of like more bitter and bitter um, and that they were actually very selfish. They, they desperately wanted to hold on to everyone around them. Um, 
and d- they held on to that part of themselves the, the the hardest. They couldn't let that go. And so there's some more back and forth, some more arguing. Um, and, and then finally, our main character kind of has a, a breakthrough that maybe they can just let go. Um, except then the threat comes back. The, 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 the people who are searching for them is about to find them and they reassert their hold on the blade. And, uh, so we're like, oh, so, so they aren't going to give up. And I, I really like this. This is kind of a, a subtle, it, it requires just a slight amount of, of digging to really get it, uh, which I think is great, um, of like, hey, sometimes maybe you like letting go of your, your fear and your self-pity and, and suffering is like how you get over it. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like, a you have to sort of like not let yourself have the suffering anymore. And uh, I think that's a, it's a well-articulated and, and interesting theme for the story. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I really, really love this story. I mean, for me, the, the best part is when the um, sword starts uh, starts to speak to its own perspective on the world. And I like how different that perspective is from anything else we've like really seen. I mean... And it really does differ from from the main character's per perspective. How this sword itself just believes that the only way to peace is through murder. Which, if you really think about it, the sword itself isn't wrong, but it's going about it the entirely wrong way. And I really do like this sort of um, predicament that the main character is put in, to where this sword does grant power, but but at what cost? And that, yeah, I mean, as you said, that the whole message that really seems to be getting across is that is that sometimes, even if you do have, I guess, something good happening, this sort of power, it would be better for you to just let go. But, of course, letting go is much harder than grabbing it in the first place. So, yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of different interpretations I have of this. So, it's so it seems like the the sword story and, and the swords message is um but like about this this guy uh mm-hmm. that like hey maybe you should let yourself rot right which is a, a thing a lot of like depressed people say right just let me rot let me suffer yes right but i think the actual sort of message is more like stop holding on to the idea of wanting to rot maybe um start stop holding on to that like entitlement of letting yourself rot Mm-hmm. Um, like, I, I I think I think the main character could could amplify this a little bit more because I like their conflict is a little harder to see. Like, we know they're on the run, but like maybe there's like a deeper reason why they're yeah. on the run. Um, and then also and like wanna... like why this sword is feeding on them so much that they probably mm-hmm. see what I was getting from it is that the person the sword is de describing is not too dissimilar from the person yeah. that is currently holding it. That that there's a kinship there. That that the sword thinks that they can do the exact same thing to this main main character as they did as they did the previous person. Which could be true. Yeah. Um and um I, I, I like I like the notion of like they want to let go of the sword, but they also like don't want to face the consequences of being without it. Mm-hmm. Right. And maybe just like a little bit more uh, of setup of like what and why they are in this this sort of predicament. I mean, you don't want the message to be, "Hey, just give up." But I think it's a. I, I think it's certainly possible here to just be like, "The sword is telling you you got to give up the sword," you know, mm-hmm. um, and just sort of like let yourself suffer without it, without the help of this terrible thing. Well, I, I definitely think there's a, there's a lot of potential here for a very like clear and r- robust message. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, uh, next story is by Motive Name with. Um, or race condition, I think. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's about race. <laughs> See, when I when I read that like title, I was like, "Oh, race condition, huh?" Hmm. Because I was thinking it would it would be about race, but it ended up not being. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Um. So so we open here. Uh, with uh, our main character is at a uh, party with um. It's not a party. It's a it's a wedding. Or the mm-hmm. wedding party. Um, seeing, um, Ashish and, uh, Sarah, who are, like, two, if Sarah is a friend and Ashish is a, a second cousin that they haven't seen in a while. Um, and we sort of get a overall look at what the wedding is like. Um, but as we continue, we sort of get that our main character has some sort of ability to affect probability and sort of deciding some things to happen. Um, deciding who, that, that Sarah is going to get the bouquet, uh, so that she can be set up with Ashish. 
um, and and things like that. But uh, but at some point, it decides, okay, we're done here, and it reaches out. It um, it disappearing into uh, the void, twisting and snapping into another sort of existence. Then we're in a different uh, lifetime, a a trapper in a small village that is building a dam, and uh, they've influenced the local politics to make sure that um, the farms flood this year. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're not entirely sure why. Um, And there's uh, corruption this time. The waves turn red uh, as if the world is made of jelly. There's some corruption invading this world. And... um, but they uh, again reach out, twist, pull, and snap into a different uh, universe. And this time, they are a senior engineer building warplanes, and they're happy to do this. And they, and they use their probability to pull out uh, designs from nowhere um, and uh, continue on this. But eventually, the corruption appears, and they don't even stay a second longer after a, a speck of it appears. They snap into a different one, um, and they they even like leave their their children behind. And this time, um, they are, as I understand it, some cyclopean eldritch being under the ocean, yeah. building a temple using an invisible tool. Um, and some future archaeologists will find it. And this checklist, this, these, these vague goals that they're working toward, um, will, will be advanced. Um, but the corruption appears, and they've always done this in the air, and now that they're underwater, they have a lot more difficulty doing it. And so the corruption actually is able to eat at them and eat at their abilities a little bit before they're able to snap um, into a different reality. Um, in this lifetime, they are a cross between a laboratory and a cult hideout, uh, sort of like a facility that is built to study and support it, whatever it is. And at this point, we understand it to be very human, and it's upset. And um, basically, it is this thing versus the corruption, whatever it is. And uh, right now it's a tie, uh, but it's unclear of who's going to win in the end. And sort of an implication that, like, this creature is using power from its future self to have the powers that it does now. But that connection is now, like, broken a bit. Um, eventually, a young man asks to be, uh, to, to, to be taken into the next life because it's always terrible whenever the corruption shows up. And our creature, whatever it is... Uh, decides, you know what? Screw this. Screw talking to this guy and just leaves, presumably leaving them behind. Yeah, so I really, really dug this this story. I mean, at, you know, each one of these sort of sections is is well written uh, in itself. And it's in my first reading, I did find it, find it a bit difficult to follow the sort of through line throughout each one of these sections but as it can continued i um realized more and more that it seems that this corruption is forcing them to jump between multiple lives and i do like how we don't really go into too much detail as to the origin of this corruption and yeah this this story itself does feel like it is building towards something and i'm not in entirely sure if that's something is sort of realized within this text it does feel like if there was a second sec a a second entry or or something then the sort of purpose uh that that all this is building towards will be fully realized but but as is i i really do like it and i think the pros are are good and we're going through the sort of strange sections that um, when read to together gives gives us a really solid understanding of what is happening so overall it's it's a really great read and fantastic job yeah i was uh definitely very hooked by by this um mm-hmm. and sort of like intrigued in this increasingly inhuman and uh um like not, not not necessarily evil, but maybe self serving creature. Yeah. Um. It, I I did wish I had a little bit more to guess about regarding like why and what it's doing. If I just had like a general idea of what this checklist that it's doing is for, I wasn't sure if it's just like a feeling it has of like I need to accomplish these things to make sure I exist sometime in the future, or um. If it's like trying to increase chaos or I I don't know. I I just wanted to like a little bit more insight of like, why is it, why does it have this checklist Mm -hmm. Um, and why these specific things? 
Um, yeah. And the rest of it is fine, which is like, oh, the corruption is an antagonist. I don't necessarily need to know, oh, the corruption is a eldritch god or I don't know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, but overall, really, really great story. Up next is by Nick to you with interview so this is a a really it just makes great use of this nested narrative and mm-hmm. we open with with the nested narrative uh where someone is telling a a story about this girl this girl uh she's 16 no 14 and um she she finds this uh, spinning wheel uh that a witch put a spell on it that if you prick your needle on the spinning wheel you die uh pretty easy to avoid but she intentionally puts her thumb on it and uh, goes unconscious um and 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 dies she intentionally pricks herself and um the witch did a dumb thing and made it so if someone kisses the uh the corpse anyone that's been yeah kisses kisses the corpse um a prince charming uh they come back to life right this is is telling sleeping beauty but in a a character voice and and so the the people that were in charge of her put her in the middle of the woods and eventually a a prince uh does wake her up and then we 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 come out of it but the, the whole feeling we get from this is this is kind of a, like a ridiculous series of events and um our speaker uh tells us what the what, what the point of them telling the story is the point is is that it's stupid the kid was stupid for getting herself kid killed the witch was stupid for fucking about and the prince was stupid because he at least made out with a corpse <laughs> uh and uh, she then explains uh, why she's telling the story uh, you've been poking around us a lot, and you know this is going to get you hurt, but you keep doing it. You just keep sticking on, keep on sticking your thumb out like it's going to go into some fine ass sooner or later, but it's not. You've been cutting yourself, and we see the gun that she's holding. And I think that's a great like way to... The, the, the entire crux of this is uh, basically this woman is holding a journalist at gunpoint saying to stop snooping around because she's you're going to get cut, and this time... Um, they're not going to fuck around and leave a spell for someone to wake you up. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's a great way of like showing the character of, of this of this hitman woman, sort of the, the situation here. And I love the ju- juxtaposition of the, you know, informal way that the story is told as well with the like cold sweat tension that our, our journalist has. Um, but she goes on and they have this sort of argument back and forth. And it, it seems like the hit woman is mostly in control until f- uh, saying, we're going to, you know, kill you. We'll kill everyone, you know. And then the journalist, it, as a sort of twist, is like, oh, actually, uh, I don't even have a dog anymore. My dog's dead uh, and I don't have any friends or family. So all you can do is kill me. And that's actually not good for you. And for a second, we're like, ooh, ooh he's got some balls. <laughs> this is a, a twist. <laughs> but then the hit woman's like, okay, fine. Um, instead, we'll just kill everyone you've ever met. <laughs> and uh, we'll, 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 we'll kill the, the hot dog guy. And you're going to be responsible for all these deaths. And the journalist is just like, gulp. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's a nice little, little little twist on the interaction. I think it's a, it, it, this is a like a common enough uh, trope, but I think it's like very well executed. I think this is exactly a, a, a really good practice of uh, doing the right thing. Definitely, yeah. Uh, I really like how this story goes from comical to to sinister in the drop of a dime. I mean, I was in 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 the beginning because the uh, story within the story was told in a very snappy and uh, unconventional way. But then as we go further and we realize that, well, this is a very dangerous situation to this journalist, that just sort of puts us even deeper into what this gripe is really about. And yeah, overall, I think the dialogue does a fantastic job at um, conveying both of these characters uh, going into how how sort of boneheaded the um, journalist really is, and how serious this uh, this sort of gun woman is. So yeah, overall, I think this story works very well within itself, and it has a fantastic voice and a really good tone switch half halfway through. So overall, I really love this story and great job. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a very great practice. Mm-hmm. Well, all right. And our final story for this week is by Sarah Penguin with Once Divorced, Never Married. Oh, a fun title. I enjoyed it. <laughs> um, Very fun. So uh, we open here with um, a shame to break up a family, but debts must be paid. Uh, <laughs> Marla, presumably some sort of witch, um, has arrived at the door um, uh, with a, a, a woman who's just put her baby to sleep, saying that she's here to collect her husband's debt. And... Um, we then cut to them making a deal in a greenhouse filled with plants. 
um, where the husband is making a deal to extend the life of her, his, his mother in exchange for his firstborn. And that's, so presumably that is what Marla is here for. Life for life, right? She needs an apprentice. So at least it's not a sacrifice. We can appreciate that. Um, and uh, then, so we, we, we cut back with the, the two uh, arguing, you sold our child and never told me? Is that why you wanted a child so badly? <laughs> but then someone else appears. Uh, a ghostly image of a woman wearing a black t-shirt and blue jeans, short black hair, and many piercings across her face and ears, saying, I'm here to collect my child. And then we cut to a, a different scene with Elizabeth, this other uh, witch, or not Elizabeth, sorry, um, Darlene. Um, and Elizabeth is, is the wife. Um, Elizabeth uh, says her, her husband is pressuring her into having a child, which, you know, some dramatic irony. We know why. Um, and uh, so, but but she is infertile and she needs to be able to have a child, um, which is such a dedicated thing to do. What a, what a hero. <laughs> um, what a self-sacrificing, loving person. Even though she doesn't tell her, her husband, at least, you know, she's trying to fulfill his wishes. And Darlene says, okay, I can make it so you can have children but uh, give me your firstborn um and so now we come back to the central conflict here uh both uh darlene and marla have a claim to this to this child um marla was uh promised at first but it's only it, it only exists because darlene gave the mother the ability to have children so they both have a pretty good claim um they agree that there's only one way to settle this and then they immediately say that they don't agree with the solution uh, in a different scene. They've spoken to the Great Mother Tree, um, which uh, is even more uh, an important tree than uh, Yggdrasil, because um, <laughs> it gave the sapling that made it. Uh, and it's covered in crabs, which is really fun. Um, and they're, they're, they chitter and give their judgment, um, <laughs> which, which is basically just a, a divorced settlement. Um <laughs> Uh, Marla can have the summer and winter solstices and Luchnasta and Darlene will have Ostara, Samhan and Mabon and, and then they negotiate some more uh, but basically they're going to share custody of this apprentice kid um, <laughs> and it's it's just a really it's a funny setup for uh, these two different witches who are very clearly differing um, in, in aesthetic and style and purpose and um, it's very entertaining it's very it's very cute yeah I, I thought the story was hilarious uh, through and through and I really do like all of these twists that are like uh, in this. I mean, you you own one witch, you're like firstborn, but but the only way to to get that firstborn is by going to another witch, which you also own your 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 firstborn. <laughs> I think that yeah, overall, I think this plot is just very well con constructed, and it definitely carries you throughout the entire story to a T, really. Um, and yeah, going back, I think the the prose does does a really great job of um, supporting this this very telling dialogue that is that's featured throughout this this story. And yeah, I I really do like the um, usage of nested narrative here. It uh, provides the audience with really great uh, context that does turn to irony later on. And yeah, overall, I think this story is fantastically constructed. So this was a great great job this week yeah yeah it was um i i love the the setup and and what it makes us think about it and i love how it just slots together like a uh, like puzzle pieces yes <laughs> well all right that's all of our stories for this week sadly we can't get to all of them but we do want to say thank you to everyone who did submit a story this week so thank you very much to ace of sword thank you so much to sithril thank you ghost pac-man 4 thank you motive name thank you nick to you and thank you so much, Sarah Penguin. Mm -hmm. And also, we want to say thank you to everyone who did leave two or more comments this week. Leaving comments not, not only helps you p pull together all of your ideas on your own story, but you are providing someone else with crucial feedback that can only help them and you get better as a writer. So thank you very much to Ace of Sword, Sarah Penguin, Motive Name, and Nick to you. You did your due diligence, and I really, really do appreciate y'all sure. uh, putting in the work. If you want to be like all of these wonderful writers and submit your story to Do the Right Thing, you can do that by going to slash r slash do the right thing. All you have to do is sit down for 30 minutes and write a complete short story using three of four words from that week. Um, uh, and additionally, we have uh, some some fun challenges, and we'll we'll reiterate what the one for this week is at the end of this episode. So, um, 
But if you can also uh, send us any feedback or anything else that you want to just tell us by sending us an email at writethinkcast.gmail.com or send us a DM on, on Twitter or Discord. Actually, maybe don't send a DM on Discord and just put it in the, the chat so we can all just discuss about it uh, <laughs> uh, on the, the Doof Media uh, Discord. Um, uh, we also have a, a Twitter, as we've mentioned, at writethinkcast.gmail.com. And if you haven't already, follow the Doof Media Twitter account, which is at Doof Media for uh, all sorts of announcements about the things that we're up to. Mm-hmm. And if you want to support us and everything else happening in Doof Media, well, first, it can be by word of mouth. Please, if you find it in your heart, tell someone else about this this podcast and the other podcasts on Doof Media. It, it, it is the best way to really help us grow, grow numbers and provide you with better content. If you want to support us monetarily, you can donate to the Doof Media Patreon. All, all you have to do is donate five, five dollars, three dollars, or or more per month. You will get access to the Doof Media Discord along with bonus content submitted by your very own Do the Right Thing. Well, the the bonus content is a is a wonderful ten dollar uh, level level patron reward, uh, but at the five dollar level, you get to participate in our monthly Doof and Chills. I'm very excited for the one this week uh, coming out um, the night November twenty first. So if if you are free that 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 weekend. Uh, um, come, come check us out. We're going to be uh, live reading a spec script for an episode of the OC. <laughs> we'll all be putting on multiple characters. It's going to be really fun. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing everyone's performances for that, especially because there's like three couples in the in the script. <laughs> so we're all going to be taking different roles in that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Nice, nice. So, Matthias, what else is going on in Doof Media? Uh, plenty. Uh, like I said, the uh, November 21st, the night of, that is when the doof and chill is but there's plenty of uh, other things going on um we have a uh, kingslinger still going on actually there's a new bonus content um the, the other levels of the tower um is is a new bo- bonus content feed of uh special kingslingers related um stuff although it's not all you don't you don't have to have been keeping up for with kingslingers to know it for example uh they just did an episode covering stand by me the oh, uh nice. the movie which is also based on a, a stephen king novel um which i have read so i'm i'm excited to listen to that episode um and uh listen to them analyze this this classic movie um the, also the doofcast recently uh covered uh that were Dissecting Director Series covering Del Toro. They j- recently covered uh, Cronus, and this week they'll be covering Mimic. Um, but the week before that, as part of a, a Doof uh, patron reward, um, they covered uh, The Princess Bride. Not a Del Toro film, but just a very, really good one. And it was really nice hearing um, Scott and Matt talk about that wonderful classic. Nice, nice. Well, all right, let's go ahead and announce next week's words. Can I give it a drum roll real quick? <laughs> that was great fantastic even so next week's words are skate pluck abundant and cathedral um yes so skate as in like a skating rink or skating along the surface of something which is sort of a a floating sort of motion a very rapid motion usually kind of slippery Mm -hmm. um you could be a skateboarder um, roller skates. You could do any sort of roller skates any sort of sci-fi sort of skating Uh, a lot of of options here um pluck as into it's a sort of like fast grasping motion mm-hmm. of um you can pluck feathers you can pluck someone out of a, a group of something pluck hair um yes pluck hairs um i'm pretty sure you could on a monopia it and make uh chickens do a plucking noise it's more like clucking mm-hmm. but pluck i'm sure is possible <laughs> or you can make it into a nonsense words uh make sure you grab the pluck for example or whatever mm, yeah or maybe someone is shortening the word potluck to pluck <laughs> Are you going to be at the pluck tonight? That will work, yeah. Bring your roast beef to the pluck. That's right. Not during coronavirus, but whatever is fine. <laughs> um, abundant, which is uh, a word that means a many of something. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, there was a abundant sunlight today. Mm-hmm. It was 80 degrees, even wow. though it's November. <laughs> And the last one, cathedral, which is a uh, usually a grand uh, religious building. Mm-hmm. Although there's there's many different ways you could use this. And they're large and typically have very intricate architecture. Um, Jarvis, what story are you going to write? Uh, well, first and foremost, let's just t- let's just reiterate to the audience what their challenge is for next week. So next week's challenge, going solely based off of the very hair hair brained all all over the place story we read from Poe. Uh, your your challenge to is create a spectacle, a 
crazy chaotic scene that is also grounded in character voice and purpose so yes next week it'll be a a bit more of a challenge we are we're asking a bit more from you but i believe that y'all will create fantastic stories that are very much worth a spectacle i i to sum that in a different way try to write a scene that is very confusing when you're trying to summarize it but when you're reading it comes across clear I think that's what you should try to aim for. Um, one more thing. The story we're going to be reading next week is The House of Asterion by uh, Jorge uh, Luis Borges, I think, mm. is how you pronounce that. Um, in, Borges is a fantastic uh, Latin American magical real, realism um, author, and I'm very excited to start bringing his stories um, into uh, our, our podcast. And also, that story is extremely quick to read. It's literally just two pages. So if you are... Um, it, it, and I've linked it on the, the post. So go ahead and give it a quick read. I, I, I think it's absolutely worth it. It's a mu- much a, a more satisfying read than the story, for example, of this week. Um, <laughs> so yeah, give it a go. Yeah, most definitely. So, Matthias, you asked me, what story am I going to write for next week? I would love to hear it. Well, I'll go ahead and tell you. Next week, my story is going to is going to take place in a good old-fashioned skate park. But you see, there are two groups that really have domain over this this the skate park. It is the skaters and the hockey players, the plucks, they are called in the small little suburb. Now, they have been at each other's throats for years. And you see, this little feud started in the West Manchester Cathedral during Sunday school. You see, these downright disgusting plot played a horrible prank on the skate captain, Timothy Chalamet, by putting a, a water-filled whoopee cushion underneath his seat to make everyone think that he peed himself. So, okay. Fast forward seven years, and now and now it's the plucks versus the skates, and their abundance of members on both sides, and so they play a classic little game: who can make the audience cheer cheer louder? Is it the skaters and their flying high octane stunts, or the plucks and their and their grudgy? gratuitous hard hard fought battles on ice but only time will tell in this age-old battle between skaters and hockey plucks fantastic i can't wait to see this this um coming of age sports special yeah thank you i uh i took a lot of inspiration from from the mighty ducks so hopefully that'll (laughs) that'll really come across yeah i it did um so uh so my story is uh is actually a a a hidden and um covered up uh instant report of the uh, pluckers marketing team so for those who don't know pluckers is actually a uh, fast food chain in um south uh united states southern united states um it's a it's a chicken place Mm -hmm. and they sell fried chicken and that's all I know about it because I never eat there. It's but not good. It's not very good. <laughs> and um, but this is an incident report written in the the marketing team's uh, history books because of course they have those, um, and it's been covered up in every other way because it's a powerful corporation. Pluckers. So Pluckers uh, was trying to do some some promotions, right? And uh, trying to you know it was it was the uh, the late eighties you know there was a lot of cool sort of like uh, trends going on including skating so what they wanted to do was to make all their delivery boys uh, be um, uh, to to skate right um, and uh, it was it was it went well for a little bit everyone liked seeing the short shorts and the skaters um, and the the pluckers branded uh, equip uh, safety equipment. Um, and it was it was very nice. Uh, however, there was this one time where a um, a skater delivery boy um, had a very big order for a, a Catholic cathedral, actually mm. a very big order of of chicken, and it was so big that they couldn't actually just like carry it in in the bag. So they uh, had to carry a, um, a red um, one of those like lo- the wheelbarrows, you know, the ones that like dra- drag across the ground and like usually like kids sit in them, yeah. um, just stacked high like an entire pyramid of fried chicken on <laughs> there. And it was it was going well. They skated across town because um, that's just what they had to do. And they but they eventually got to the cathedral. cathedral. And they skated down the middle because that was the only way where they could get this gigantic amount of fried chicken while 
uh, the the service was in was in session, uh, but they went down and um, started slipping actually uh, because of of the rug and started slipping, pulling the fried chicken behind them, and they actually crashed into the altar, scattering an abundant amount of chicken corpses just across the cathedral floor, all over the place, and um, as a result, God decided to smite them. <laughs> And all of and and the pluckers of that town, um, in actually a pretty horrific and gratuitous way, all of the chicken corpses actually came to life and devoured the poor skater boy, and the um, uh, the what what what's what's, a, what's an assistant to the to the to the priest deacon. What's deacon I thought so, but I didn't know if that was a different denomination. I was going to mess things up. Um, the deacon who had placed the order, they were both devoured. Um, in that very moment, leaving nothing but fried bones um, there on on the cathedral steps. Um, and then um, all of the uh, fried chicken inside of that pluckers as well rose from the dead um, and for three days played the town before um, <laughs> evaporating. Um, and as a result, there is no pluckers in um, Florida, Kentucky. <laughs> Wow, that's, that's the name of the town. That's kind of horrible. I mean, I knew God didn't want you to be eating in his places, but to smite and create living chickens and destroy a pluckers, that's a lot. Yeah. That is a lot. Yeah. I don't know if that was really the, the right thing to do, to be honest. Um, yeah, it's not entirely clear if it was the work of uh, Satan or, or God, um, but considering it happened inside the cathedral... 